Good morning. I'm Pastor Carlene. Thanks for joining us uh, for worship this morning with Wesley. I am so glad that you're taking time uh, to draw nearer to God and uh, to one another across time and space and worship today. As we begin, um, I'll be lighting the Christ candle. If you have a candle at home to light as well, I invite you to do that. We always light this candle because it reminds us that the light of Christ keeps on shining and there is no darkness that can put it out. And so as we um, come into worship, we come into this light and we are reminded that it shines in every way that we need it to today. So I invite you, um, if you're with others, look at them, um, hold them in the light this morning Look out your windows at your neighbors, uh, the people passing by, walking their dogs or driving in their cars. Hold them in this light this morning. If there's anyone you've had conflict with this week, hold them in this light as well. We are reminded that all of us are made in the image of God and that this light is available to shine within us all. And I invite you uh, to bring your own self into this light. May the light of Christ shine in every place in our heart, wherever there is any darkness of pain or hurt or fear of sorrow. We hold ourselves in this light and we let it shine upon us. We come into worship with honesty, just as we are, and just as we are, we are accepted and received in this light. And so I invite you uh, to say with other members of Wesley, our statement of welcome. At Wesley, we believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You are invited to worship, wonder, and discover God's grace with us. And, and to, to participate, participate fully in this community of faith. Whether you are young or old, single or married, gay or straight, full or empty, who you are and where you are on life's journey matters to us. And you are welcome here or wherever you may be to, to seek with us the God who seeks. That's all. That's all. That's all. Please join me in our call to worship. Happy are we when our treasures cannot be quantified. Happy are we when our knowledge is tempered by mystery. Happy are we when our pain is held in the balm of love. Happy are we when our delight comes from beyond ourselves. Let us worship God. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be
Great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall. Still be my vision. Well, good morning, kids. Uh, today is uh, Sunday. It's actually the last Sunday of the month, um, so we've got that going for us. It's been a crazy uh, January. Uh, lots of things have happened um, in in the uh, in the world, and some of them good and some of them bad. Um, but I wanted to just say congratulations on making it through um, the first month of 2021. And I also want to just chat with you about today's scripture a little bit. So it's, first of, all, first of all, before we talk about the scripture, I just want to say this. I want to say, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever gotten in trouble? Um, I know I have. Have you ever gotten in trouble with your parents? I know when I was a kid, I have. And maybe even as an adult, I have too. Um... Have you ever done something where your parents have um, told you not to do it and instead of listening to them and obeying what they're telling you, you look them directly in the eye and then you do the thing that they tell you not to do anyway? Woo! That is generally not a very smart decision. I know in our house, what that's called is that's called open defiance. And, and, and it is one of the very worst things that you can do, um, in, in our household. And I am not advocating whatsoever to any of you kids to go and, um, do, you know, perform something Call, uh, that's related to open defiance with your parents, especially the two kids who are sitting in my living room right now. Um, but I want to talk to you about scripture because the reason why I bring it up is because in today's scripture, I want you to listen to it really carefully because that's exactly what Jesus did. See, there were these people who were watching Jesus and basically being like, you can't do that. Don't do that. Um, and instead of um, not doing it like he was expected to do, Jesus looks them in the eye and he does the thing that he, um, he's being told not to do and drives the people crazy. But the thing, the difference between um, maybe uh, getting in trouble like that in your house with your parents and what Jesus did is the thing that the the uh, the people um, were telling Jesus not to do was to heal a man. See, back then, um, the there was these rules that said that uh, you couldn't do any sort of work whatsoever on um, on the Sabbath, which is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Um, and uh, and Jesus decided, and healing um, a man was considered work back then. And Jesus decided that it would be worth the trouble to heal that man on the Sabbath than it would be to just leave the man um, uh, um, sick. 
um, this is what uh, uh, John Lewis, the civil rights leader, calls, I think, good trouble. That is trouble in which you break the rules and you go against um, the, the, the rules of, 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 of your culture, of your time, um, of your institutions in order to do good in the world. See, Jesus uh, said, is it more important for this man to be able to use his hand and to be um, a, a, a functioning member of society? I have the ability to heal him right now. Is it better for me to just heal him? Or is it better for me to leave him sick and 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 uh, and and follow these these rules. Well, Jesus decided that it was better to break the rules than to keep um, people um, hurting and in trouble. So um, Jesus, you know, Jesus got in a lot of good trouble, and um, I'm not telling you to go and um, be openly defiant with your parents uh, this week. But I am telling you that sometimes um, when we deal with rules um, that are, are, um, are unjust, um, it's time for us to stand up and to, um, to change those rules um, and to defy them so that people, everybody, um, can, uh, can, uh, can live healthy and productive lives. So, my friends, um, with you and your parents in mind, you and your grandparents in mind, I invite you um, to listen to the scripture this morning and to think about ways that you maybe this week can get into some good trouble. Bye, you guys. The Prayer of Illumination Loving God, joy of creation, pour out your Spirit on us, that we may hear your ancient words in a new key. Inspire us to sing your praise in every situation and with every generation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We're going to read Luke 6, 1 through 16. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, 
Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who are with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to do, to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to destroy it? Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. In these days, as he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Word of life, write it on our hearts. Good morning again, friends. Well, I can't see your hands, but if I could, I would ask a show of hands for everyone whose favorite heroes are also rebels. Not the turn your back on the world kind of rebels that actually end up being more like villains, uh, but rebels who get in trouble because they know when to break a rule in pursuit of the good. Uh, these hero rebel types, they fill our novels and our movies and our comic books, but they also fill our history books as everyone who has turned history in the direction of justice and equity has been a rebel, willing to break the rules in order to make the world a more just place. Well, today's scripture gives us rebel with a cause Jesus, who publicly and blatantly breaks the rules while confronting the system to expose its underlying cruelty and provide moral clarity. Well, some of the, uh, the best heroes are rebels, um, and some of the worst villains, though, are not necessarily the obviously evil ones. Um, some of the worst villains are the ones who pose as keepers of the good, the rule enforcers. Uh, for any of you who are Harry Potter fans, um, of course there's Voldemort, you know, the main evil villain of the whole story. But even more hateable than Voldemort is Dolores Umbridge, the pink bow ruffle wearing pearl clutching government official who resorts to torture to discipline children for breaking the rules. She is so much more hateable uh, than the main villain. <laughs> and in the context of our scripture, you know, we expect the occupying Romans uh, to, to be the big villains. They are oppressive and cruel and genuinely horrible. Uh, but so often in, uh, in the stories of Jesus, it's the super spiritual Pharisees who take good laws and then use them to control and oppress people who so often fill uh, the role of villain. So today, the Pharisees in the name of the law of God come after Jesus and some of his disciples. And Jesus says, bring it. The law in question today is one of the big 10 commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, before we get much further into this passage, I am tempted to slip in a little side sermon just about this commandment. It deserves its own sermon for its goodness, actually. It is arguably the most disregarded commandment by Christians who somehow only have the imagination either to apply this law in oppressive or shallow or counterproductive ways, or else just disregard it entirely. Um, we live in a culture that wars against the possibility of true Sabbath keeping, and we are not 
accustomed to or in any kind of rhythm to even fathom the restorative power and beauty of this holy law. Um, and I am, I am right there with everyone else in it. And that could be another sermon. But it's worth noting right up front that Jesus is coming for the folks who have twisted the commandment into a tool of oppression and control. Um, not to the heart of the law itself. So the conflict starts when some of um, Jesus's uh, disciples, uh, they're walking from one place to another on the Sabbath. Uh, they apparently haven't packed a lunch, they're hungry. And they pull some grain off of some stalks and they rub it between their hands to get the chaff off. And then they munch on, on the kernels within. The Pharisees, who are a sect of leaders known for their earnest spirituality, for going above and beyond in their devotion to God, um, people who actually had very good reputations in the community at the time. They feel threatened by Jesus and by his popularity. And these, um, these folks, they are the ultimate law keepers and rule protectors. They measure virtue by compliance. And they see what seems like a petty little thing as an opportunity to fully discredit Jesus. You know, look, this guy claims to be a teacher and his followers can't even obey the most basic commandment. And the smear campaign is spread around the community and forms what the Pharisees hope will be a trap for Jesus. Will he break the Sabbath again in front of everyone? And if he does, they are fully ready to point the finger of judgment for what true prophet of God openly breaks God's laws. Well, there are times in the Gospels when Jesus keeps a low profile and tries to avoid drawing too much attention to certain miracles. But this isn't one of them. Jesus rebuts their accusations with um, first an example from the scripture of when David also broke the same law and was not blamed. He's comparing the virtue of keeping the letter of the law with the real problem of hunger. Alleviating hunger wins over strict observance of this law. And Jesus makes this claim while also making an even more inflammatory claim, declaring his own authority. He is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't rule him. He rules the Sabbath. So, the Pharisees watch him closely. They're looking for an opportunity to catch him breaking the law. They literally want to bring charges against him and arrest him and put him in jail. And as if to prove the point of their own upside down moral thinking, they're actually expecting that he might heal somebody on the Sabbath. And the idea of someone being free of a physical ailment doesn't bring them any joy. Like that miracle doesn't phase them at all. They are entirely focused on this narrow, oppressive interpretation of a law that leaves no room for empathy or for love, the higher law. Well, Jesus doesn't sneak off and heal somebody on the sly in this situation. Jesus sees a man with a withered hand and asks him to stand up in front of everyone in the synagogue. And then he speaks directly to the legal experts and the Pharisees who are salivating at this point in hopes that Jesus will do what they want him to do. But Jesus turns the tables on them, though, and asks them publicly a proving moral question. Is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or destroy it. Jesus offers something that the law and order folks in the crowd do not have, moral clarity. And the interpretation of the law is now tested on the basis of its compliance with the higher standard of good versus evil and life saving versus destroying, instead of the law being the standard for judging behavior goodness and life 
become the standard. And then Jesus healed the man in front of everyone on the Sabbath. And it's worth noting that this is more than just physical healing. Jesus is restoring this man um, to full participation in the community, restoring his dignity, releasing him from the stigma that that his disability has been caused by God's judgment, enabling him to go into Jerusalem and worship in the temple. There is so much more healing and wholeness being done in this act of compassion than just physical healing. Jesus is pulling someone from the very margin into the center and restoring his whole life. And the Pharisees are just livid. There are good laws born of good intent that when followed make humans better at living well with one another in society. There are good laws that can be applied in opposition to their intent and get used to cause harm. And then there are just bad laws of bad or evil intent designed to impose or maintain oppression of people. The question for us trying to follow Christ is, do we have the moral clarity and the moral courage to recognize when laws or rules are being used to oppress and destroy, and will we do something about it? And whether that's the scripture in the context of people of faith or the legal system in the context of our larger society, the same question abides. Well, this is uh, maybe, a, maybe a silly example, but when I was um, a freshman in high school, there was a rule at the school that you had two days to turn in a note in the attendance office after you had been absent in order to get it excused. If you didn't do that, uh, you would be put on the Saturday school list. And this was um, just shortly before um, they stopped funding this kind of thing. But at the time, Saturday school was a real threat. Um, turn in the note or get on the list. Well, I missed the last day of school before winter break because of a planned um, family thing that was going on. And I told all my teachers ahead of time. I turned in my homework early. I think I even arranged to take a quiz a day early. Um, I was being super responsible, I thought. And then, um, you know, two and a half weeks later, when I got back from winter break, I completely forgot about that and didn't turn in a note. And I found out about it because my very angry and sometimes abusive basketball coach uh, saw my name on the Saturday school list and yelled at me and told me I couldn't play that week. Well, I was horrified. Um, I went straight to the vice principal to explain the situation and to appeal. And I swear, Dolores Umbridge was cast with this woman in mind. <laughs> um, she was so horrible. Um, to her, I had broken the rules and I must pay the consequences for it. None of the circumstances mattered. Rules were rules. I was going to be punished just as soundly as if I had just skipped school and smoked on the lawn across the street with a bunch of my friends. Um, they didn't call her Wicked Wanda for nothing. And I, I still just kind of bristle at the injustice of it, the lack of care, um, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Um, and there were other times um, that if I think about them, they still bother me when teachers who were supposed to be on the side of a student's success used the rules to punish and ostracize students and um, actually contribute to their failure instead. Thankfully, um, they were the minority, <laughs> but they leave a lasting impression. It's kind of a silly story, um, especially in the larger scheme of things. It's nothing. You know, it was Saturday school. Life went on. But um, rules and laws are actually notoriously used to perpetuate real evil and lasting injustice on a grand scale. We must never forget that slavery was legal. Jim Crow was legal. 
The decimation of Native Americans was often wrapped up in laws and rules passed on purpose to ensure the destruction of their lives and culture. And even good and reasonable laws are often used as tools of oppression in this country to this day. Just compare what happens to people who get pulled over for something like a broken taillight. For many black folks in our country, that has been the last thing to happen before they are killed. Laws and the inconsistent enforcement of laws in our nation is one of the most blatant and perpetual examples of systemic racism. Do we have the moral clarity to see it? Do we have the moral courage to change it? We sometimes pass laws so that we can avoid dealing with our collective and societal moral failings. We make laws against living outdoors, but fail to address the myriad of issues that lead to homelessness. We provide abysmal mental health care services. We have very little access to affordable housing. We make laws against giving food to people standing on corners, but fail to address the problem of hunger. We have entire systems of rules, regulations, and laws that make it more expensive to be poor, ensuring that once people have sunk into poverty, it will be almost impossible to claw back out of it again because of all of the, the systemic rules put in place to make it so. Do we have the moral clarity to see it? Do we have the moral courage to change it? One of the issues we face that often gets caught up in, but the law says arguments is, is the issue of immigration. Immigration laws in our country are designed to make it incredibly difficult to become a citizen and in some cases are written with the intent to be cruel to desperate people who are seeking asylum or living undocumented. Just before the pandemic hit last year, I went as an observer uh, to a hearing for a woman, a mother of three, who is um, living here while her application for asylum was being considered. Uh, she's doing everything she can to follow all of the complicated rules and laws um, of this process. And through no fault of her own, um, the place where she was living, the landlord failed to pay the bill and her electricity was cut off. And so she had to very quickly move her three young kids uh, to another location. She wasn't able to notify ICE ahead of time. And then when she reported her move and her new address shortly after the fact, she was berated and threatened with deportation for failing to follow the rules. She was told to find someone to take care of her kids and come back after the weekend, prepared to be taken into detention and deported. Um, her church, thankfully, was able to connect her with a good attorney and a cloud of witnesses, of which I got to be one, um, gathered outside the doors. We sang hymns loudly. And thankfully, she was allowed that day to stay. But the obeying the law excuse had been used to cause her and her kids terror. Um, a family desperately seeking asylum from unbelievably dark circumstances they had fled. If I start talking about family separation, which I trust you all know about, um, I'll go on too long. There is no doubt we have complex, multifaceted problems to solve when it comes to things like immigration law. But there is no excuse for being evil. <laughs> Not on any one of these points and more. There is no excuse for doing the wrong thing, for causing harm. There is no way to justify a total lack of empathy and humanity by saying, oh, they should just follow the law. And if we do that, we had better not expect Jesus to be on our side. The one who heals on the Sabbath is going to offer us some correction. Do we have the moral clarity to see it? Do we have the moral courage to live it? We don't just read scripture. If we're doing it right, 
the scripture also reads us. What kind of people are we? What kind of presence do we offer the world? Rules and laws that create barriers to people drawing near to the love of God or being accepted fully in the community of faith? Are we get off my lawn people or are we come on in and have a soda people? Do we leave a trail of brokenness and destruction behind us or do we look around with moral clarity and moral courage? Are we making goodness and life wherever we can? Let's keep the good work going. Let's keep seeking God together that we will be ever more who we are called to be and live as morally clear, morally courageous followers of Christ in this world. Amen.
Well, as, um, as I uh, share announcements, I invite you to share your joys and concerns in the comments on the side, and we'll pray together in a moment. Just a couple of announcements, but they're good ones. Construction on the coffee shop continues. Uh, one of the things that we have been able to add as a part of this um, project is an ADA bathroom. And that bathroom is also going to include a shower, which is gonna open up some new opportunities for us to serve the world together. Um, so that's underway and going well. Uh, you may remember last summer, Sweet Bay Shave Ice uh, was on our patio and um, it was so wonderful to have them here and they want to come back. And so um, I want to just let you know to start watching for them come February. Uh, we'll have more details for when they um, appear back on the patio again, but it will be sooner rather than later. And finally, I have an appeal. Um, the Papin Community Garden is going into um, another growing season. This has been just one of the most wonderful ongoing ministries. Um, this will be year six, I believe. And um, it is a partnership uh, with our neighbors, people from our neighborhood, with Huerto de la Familia, um, with folks from the church, and also with um, veterans from the VA. It's just a place of community and life. And um, we, have, um, we have a little garden team that's active but we need a new, um, we need a new person to lead our garden team. Um, this isn't a particularly odious job. Uh, you do have lots of support for it, um, but it, we do need someone who um, is excited about the garden and uh, wants to keep this ministry thriving in the coming year. If you are interested at all, please contact me, carlene.clark at gmail.com um, as soon as possible. Um, I promise uh, you will feel rewarded um, by this just really lovely place of life that's a part of our ministry here. Well, I want to um, invite you uh, to pray with me. Gracious God, um, for every need, for every point of concern uh, that we've shared or that we haven't been able to share, um, we lift it up to you. Many of us are struggling. Um, many of us are in need of your light to shine and uh, of others uh, to come in, in places in our life um, that are empty. And I pray that you would shine in every darkness. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear you um, as we seek to be the answer uh, to prayers of others in this world. For all of the joys and the many good things that we're celebrating, oh, we lift them up to you with gratitude. We thank you that um, you are always at work in the world, sometimes in ways we can just see so clearly, other times um, in places we don't see until later. And we thank you for your faithfulness, for your provision, for your generosity and your great, great love. We love you too. Amen. I want to um, also uh, let you know it is Fish Sunday. If we were gathered together, this would be a time to share um, about birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations and turn those little joys um, into cash for fish who does really good things in our community. If you want to donate to Fish today, you can do so on our website. You can designate that um, by name in, uh, in the little drop-down box in the donation area, wesleyeugene.org. Thank you all so much for your ongoing support and faithfulness. And I want to invite you uh, to pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come and
As you go today, I pray that you go with your hearts lifted up and encouraged. I pray that you go with peace, with love, and with joy. Just spread it around in this world. Amen.